Welcome to Flippening, the first and original podcast for full-time, professional, and institutional crypto investors. I'm your host, Clay Collins. Each week, we discuss the cryptocurrency economy, new investment strategies for maximizing returns, and stories from the front lines of financial disruption. Go to Flippening.com to join our newsletter for cryptocurrency investors and find out just why this podcast is called Flippening. Clay Collins is the CEO of Nomics. All opinions expressed by Clay and podcast guests are solely their own opinion and do not reflect the opinion of Nomics or any other company. This podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only and should not be relied upon as the basis for investment decisions. Today, I'm joined by Patrick Meenan, who is a general partner at Arthur Ventures and a board member at Nomics, the company that produces and funds this podcast. Patrick has been with Arthur Ventures since 2012. Before that, he was in Corp Dev at Microsoft. Patrick and I go back quite a bit. He was involved in the first round of funding for my previous company, Lead Pages, which went on to acquire an email service provider called Drip. Because of that, we sat on a board together for over six years and have gotten to know each other over a pretty long time horizon. Patrick is also the lead investor at Nomics. This conversation is notable not only because of the subject matter, but also because it's a window into how Nomics operates and how we approach things at the board level. I wanted Patrick on this show because of his wisdom around growing and building companies outside of the Bay Area. In a lot of ways, his views are contrarian, counterintuitive, and really fly in the face of conventional wisdom on growing venture-backed companies. I believe this interview is highly relevant to blockchain startups. Indeed, most blockchain startups are not in the valley, and even if they were, the standard playbooks just wouldn't apply to them because some of the unique dynamics of this space, which we'll get to a little bit in this conversation. In this episode, we discuss methods and approaches for funding, growing, and operating your company outside of Silicon Valley and even outside of the United States. My conversation with Patrick is broken up into four chapters. In chapter one, we discuss lessons Patrick has learned investing outside of the valley. In chapter two, we discuss business operations. In chapter three, we discuss fundraising when you don't have the networks and network effects that the coasts often provide. Finally, in chapter four, we close our conversation by talking about investment opportunities in the blockchain space. We'll get right to this episode in just a second, but before we get started, I'd like to pause for a moment to tell you that this episode is brought to you by the good folks at Nexo. Here's a word from them. Nexo is the only lender offering instant crypto credit lines, which let you use digital assets as collateral to get cash in 45 fiat currencies and stable coins. And Nexo has a big announcement related to credit lines. Their annual interest rate for credit lines are now starting at just 5.9% which may very well be the lowest borrowing rate in the whole industry. Nexo is also a strategic partner of exchanges, OTC desks, and crypto funds through its portfolio of structured financial products. Institutional counterparties can earn up to 8% annually on their idle stablecoins, enter into asset swap agreements, or directly borrow crypto. Individuals also park their cash and stablecoins at Nexo's interest earning account to get an annual return of 8%. What's more, interest is paid out daily and you can add or withdraw funds at any time. So if you're looking to borrow, lend, or swap digital assets, Nexo is your go-to partner. Definitely explore nexo.io or reach out to them via email. Here's their address. It's institutions at nexo.io. This episode is also brought to you by the Nomics API and CSV data export service. If you need an enterprise-grade crypto market data API for your fund, smart contract, or app, or if you need historical CSV dumps of trading data or crypto market cap data from top exchanges or even obscure ones, then consider trying out the Nomics API or our historical data export service. Our cryptocurrency API enables programmatic access to clean, normalized, and gapless primary source trade data across a number of cryptocurrency exchanges. Instead of having to integrate with multiple exchange APIs of varying quality, you can get everything through one screaming fast fire hose. And if you'd like to order historical cryptocurrency market data as CSV exports from top exchanges, then email us at sales at nomics.com. Okay, back to our regularly scheduled program. Here's my conversation with Patrick Meenan, partner at Arthur Ventures, Nomics board member, and all around insightful dude. Enjoy.
So Patrick, can you tell us a little bit about the origin story of your involvement in venture capital and also the origin story of Arthur Ventures? I started investing, being more formally involved in venture capital in 2012, which is when I joined Arthur Ventures. And we've really been doing this for the last, the last six years. Prior to joining Arthur Ventures, I was actually at Microsoft out in Seattle. And there I was in their, their M&A group. And so I was working on the team that bought and sold companies on behalf of Microsoft. And the unique time period I was there, which was 2008 to 2012, was this time where we actually started investing more than buying companies in that phase of, of Microsoft's timeline. And so a lot of the work I was doing was really large investments, like call it 50 to $100 million in large commercial agreements with startups. And that's really what got me into investing. Before Microsoft, I just worked as a technology investment banking analyst at a bank called Piper Jaffray in their software investment banking group. So the kind of consistent story is just being in the broader software ecosystem in a mixture of you know, M&A work, investment banking work, and then at Microsoft investing. And really what caused me to go to Arthur Ventures was this really unique opportunity to join a firm, uh, not at its founding, the firm was founded before I joined, but really at its infancy stage before it raised its first formal fund. So I knew you were involved in corp dev activities at Microsoft. I didn't know that you were selling companies. What does that look like? Is it when they, when Microsoft acquires a company and, and no longer wants it, or there's a branch of the business that it, it thinks is a distraction and wants to, to liquidate? What does selling look like? Usually what it would look like is we bought a company, just like you said, and there happened to be some sort of part of the business that we didn't want. They're usually not that material. The one I did was probably one of the more sizable divestitures they did. So back in the mid-2000s, they bought a company called Aquantiv, which was the number two player next to DoubleClick. So Google bought DoubleClick, Microsoft bought Aquantiv. Aquantiv had a bunch of different sorts of assets, and one of them was an actual digital agency. So they owned a digital agency called Razorfish which was kind of a pioneer in that space. And being Microsoft, we didn't need an agency. And so uh, we actually ended up selling that division for $530 million to Publicis, which is one of the largest ad agency holding companies in the world. But that's an example of what it would look like. Yeah, that makes sense. I remember Razorfish, you know, back in the day going to their website and there was some crazy flash animation thing going on that people oh, yeah. don't do anymore. <laughs> Absolutely. But they were really the pioneers in, the, in that space. So it was... Uh, that was a process by which pretty much every big, large ad holding company was quite interested. When it came to the, the large investments that you were doing, how much of that was simply trying to get a return on Microsoft's huge balance sheet versus some kind of strategic interest? You know, the motivation was not exactly what you would think. So in the time period before I joined at Microsoft, and again, this is like 13 years ago, I'm like really dating myself here or maybe not 13, 11 years ago, they were buying about 30 to 35 companies a year. A big proponent of that or a big uh, cause of that was that a lot of the business unit owners would get what was called P&L relief, which basically said, if you have your annual target is a business leader and you buy a company that's losing money, we're not going to penalize you for that on your actual, you know, your year-end numbers. Right around the time I joined, that ended. A big reason that ended was I joined in fall away when like the financial crisis happened. And so everyone had a bigger focus on the actual P&L. Even though you have that constraint, you don't lose the desire to make strategic decisions. And so what we ended up doing were these big commercial agreements, but we wanted to invest so we didn't have to consolidate the P&L. So the actual rules, they may have changed by now, but if you own more than 50% of a company, you have to consolidate that, that company's full P&L onto your balance sheet. If you, at the time, if you owned between 20 and 50%, you had to recognize your pro rata share. So let's say a company lost you know, $10 million in a year and you owned 30%, you had to recognize you know, $3 million loss on your P&L. But if you owned sub 20% and you didn't have any hairy control mechanisms or anything like that, you didn't have to consolidate anything. And so if you were able to find the right deal where you didn't have to consolidate the startup's P&L on your own P&L, but you were able to do some really interesting commercial agreement stuff that almost made it seem like you were getting a lot of the benefits you would have from buying a company, that was a pretty good model for us at that time. So that was really the origin of why that happened. And again, things have totally changed since then. That context dates itself as of 2012. But that was why we were doing what we did. When you refer to the commercial contracts with startups, that's 100% around purchasing equity, not actually buying services from them. Is that correct? Oh, no, it's actually both. So we invested in a company called AppNexus, 
at Nexus, a uh, really successful company. We invested, I think it was in the mid hundreds valuation or something like that. And I think now that company has been acquired by AT&T for at least a couple billion dollars. But at that time, what we did is we invested in the company, but then we also had an arrangement, our commercial agreement, where we decided to push a lot of our ad inventory to AppNexus so they can monetize it. So it's just kind of an example of, you know, we're giving a startup a lot of benefit. We also want an equity stake in that startup at that time without having to buy it. And so that's really what the, the notion was. So very little were we sitting around saying, we think we're going to 5x this capital in five years. And that's the motivation. It was, we want to do a lot of business with this company. We want to have an equity stake in this company. And we definitely think we're going to make money, but no one is really getting promoted because of some quick turn on, a, on an investment from a financial return perspective. What's happening in terms of Corp Dev right now? And what do you see happening in this space that, that might be interesting to entrepreneurs? How has it changed since 2012? Yeah, well, I definitely think M&A activity is quite strong right now. I think that's the, the broader headline versus what's happening specifically within Corp Dev. I think that you're having pretty much every large tech company you can think of as being very active right now. So it just feels like it's a really great time if you're running a company to have strategics that are interested in your company right now, because they just, again, they've got a strong propensity to move. I don't think anything necessarily from Corp Dev specifically is, is that notable. Most of these decisions, or at least what I think is more relevant to entrepreneurs, is that most of these purchasing decisions that these large companies are making, very often it's driven by product leadership or business unit leadership and the relationships that have been built up over a long period of time. So in most companies, I don't think the actual Corp Dev person is necessarily like the right entry point. Got it. So other, other strong partnerships at the senior executive kind of level of the company are probably a good way to go, or at least other senior leaders in the, in, you know, from the acquiring company side. Yeah, absolutely. This stuff takes time. Let's transition to the origin of, of Arthur Ventures. You know, we, we heard a little bit about your path. I think Arthur Ventures also has an interesting origin story. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Well, maybe we should actually just state what Arthur Ventures even does. For, for context going into the story. So at Arthur Ventures, we invest in B2B software companies that are located anywhere outside of San Francisco. The typical deal for Arthur Ventures is us investing two to $5 million of our own capital as the lead investor, often only investor, in companies with call it one to $5 million in revenue. We're leading all of our investments, like I said, we sit on the board, everything like that. But the important thing there is that it's all B2B software, all outside of uh, San Francisco and, and all post-traction. The story of the firm, it was actually founded by my partner, James, and his uncle, Doug, Doug Burgum. Doug himself just had this really phenomenal success story of building a company outside of San Francisco and in Fargo, North Dakota, of all places. Doug was a part of the Stanford MBA class of, I always forget the class, but it's 80, 81, or 82, whatever class Malcolm Gladwell wrote about in his book, Outliers, of the, you know, a bunch of people at the right place at the right time. Doug moves back to Fargo, North Dakota after business school, and he becomes the majority owner in a small company that was reselling computers in Fargo. And there was basically one or two people writing accounting software code. Doug took over that company with the help of some family capital. So he was able to uh, get some capital from his family to invest in Great Plains and starts growing uh, this company into what was Great Plains Software, which is an accounting software company. Over the span of about 20 years, Doug is able to take this company, take it public in North Dakota, and it ultimately gets acquired by Microsoft for $1.1 billion in like 2000 or 2001. And so the reason it's such a unique story is that Doug basically just lived the challenge of building a very large company in a really unique part of the country. Since then, Doug's done some amazing things, like he was chairman of Success Factors and totally sold the SAP. And he was also chairman of uh, Atlassian and ultimately stepped down a few years ago because he had an opportunity to run for and ended up being elected as governor of North Dakota. So Doug himself just has this prolific software background. He and James found Arthur Ventures actually back in 2008 as a sort of family office to invest in entrepreneurs in the state of North Dakota to basically provide that seed capital that was not there for Doug many years before. They did that from about 2008 to 2012, was not overly focused from an industry perspective, some medical device, some software. And then ultimately, they, when they realized they should, you know, B2B software is where they should really be focused. That's around the time that I joined them. We had a very strong mutual connection. The guy I was working for at Microsoft at the time 
It was Doug's number two guy at Great Plains. And it was really just this good timing thing where they said, we want to raise you know, a real fund with outside capital, and we want to have somebody else come and run it with us. And so that was basically what, what brought me here. And I was really compelled by that unique background of the family when I joined. I definitely think that Doug's story and, and the story of Arthur Ventures is, is pretty incredible. Like just, just to be involved in three billion plus B2B SaaS exits. At, like, I don't know if anyone else has that kind of track record. And to do that from, from North Dakota is uh, ridiculously cool. Yes, certainly. And I think it's unique. I mean, I, I by no means was a part of the conversations, but part of the reason that the guys from Atlassian, along with Excel, because it was after uh, Excel invested, were really interested in Doug becoming chairman of the company was that he had done that in a unique geography. You know, and those guys were in Australia. They were really looking for someone who had that unique experience. And there's just not that many people that have. I mean, a lot of people know Scott Dorsey in Indianapolis. There's been a few other examples of people that have really built billion dollar plus successful software companies outside of outside of major markets. For anyone wondering, Arthur is spelled A-R-T-H-U-R. What's the background of that spelling? Oh, fair enough. Yeah. So are, people people ask, is Arthur a person? Arthur is is a town. So Arthur is a town outside of Fargo, like 20 minutes outside. Uh, I think it's between three and 400 people. And it's where the Burgum family grew up. They also have a very successful family business, which is a agriculture business that's named Arthur Companies. And that was, uh, you know, the genesis of why we were originally called uh, Arthur Ventures. Let's kick off chapter one, which is about the lessons you've learned investing outside of Silicon Valley. When you first got to Arthur Ventures and started investing, did you have a clear sense from day one that you needed a different playbook to be successful if you were going to do this from the Midwest? Or did you kind of think you were going to follow existing precedent? At the time, I, I basically view it as two things that I had to figure out is one, what does a great early stage company look like? And then two, what's the best way to generate a return where you're investing? And I think that's more of the geography thing. So getting into what a great company looks like, so I actually think that is really not that different across geography. I had this expectation coming in. When you think of, of venture capital, you usually think about it as you know companies with no revenue, relatively speculative, really, really high tech ideas. And that was kind of what I expected going in. And I learned pretty quickly that some of the most exciting opportunities there are are for companies that are generating real revenue and oftentimes don't need your money. And I would say that's probably the first thing I learned, honestly, from you, because you know, Lead Pages was the first investment I ever made. And part of the reason that I made that investment was, you know, Clay, when we met the first time, there were a bunch of people talking on a stage, kind of just about a bunch of stuff. And you were the only one up there talking about real revenue and paying customers and, and, and not needing money. And I would say that kind of opened my eyes to what's really possible in early stage investing that you can actually find great entrepreneurs, great ideas, and great businesses at the same time. That was something that was very, very different than what I expected coming in. And then from a geography perspective, I didn't realize this right away, but I think one of the biggest mistakes that people make when they're investing in geographies outside of San Francisco is that they try to mimic a playbook that exists in San Francisco. They think valuation doesn't matter because when you know Peter Fenton, who is an amazing investor in Benchmark, says valuation doesn't matter, I should do that too. And they overlook the fact that you know Peter Fenton and Benchmark have several, several multi-billion dollar public exits, and they're just incredibly special people. And they take that same approach into their own local market, and they're just like a little bit sloppy. They think that everything is going to become a billion dollar company. They think it's okay to lose half of their money. And I think that is a very unique challenge that we were able to grab onto pretty quickly and realize that you can find a great company that's growing really well, that's really exciting. And you can also invest in a manner by which you can still make a great return off a realistic outcome. And you can make an exceptional return off of a special outcome. So you mentioned that kind of the characteristics of a good company are the same regardless of geography. But I imagine that companies that don't have access to a lot of capital in their backyard or aren't built in places where you can drive to uh, one road <laughs> and uh, talk to almost all the VCs in, in one day, or I guess you can't, there's so many on that road. Those businesses have different characteristics simply because of the constraints that exist within their respective geographies. What do you see? when you're looking outside the valley, valley I, I imagine 
that a lot of the companies that you're looking for might not necessarily be looking for you or even know that it's an option to raise venture capital because there simply isn't anyone they've ever spoken to that's done it or any businesses near them that have done it. It's, it's just not something that they thought was in the cards. How do you identify those businesses? First, let me validate what you just said. The typical situation that we run into is a uh, 20-person-ish company that's, call it, $1 to $3 million in revenue. It's being led by a very product-focused entrepreneur, and it's been about a three-year path to get to that point. They may have started the business while they had another job, or they likely just kind of took their time to build this company because of what you said. There wasn't this option of, of immediate capital. And that individual, when we find him or her, they're often in a very similar mindset of, you know, I've got a couple hundred K of cash in the bank. It feels like a miracle that I'm here at this point, but I'm just now starting to see how great this company could become. So I'm curious about capital because I want to make decisions that I wouldn't normally make if I was just bootstrapping, but I also don't have time to fundraise. I don't even have a pitch deck. Okay. So just like that is the exact persona of the individual that we very commonly see in the companies that we invest in outside of the Bay Area. They're typically in large markets. So they might be in Dallas and Atlanta or Denver. They're not in like Cedar Rapids, Iowa or something like that. So there's still a lot of talent there and ability to grow the company. I would just say with that context, that individual is simply never going to be found through a traditional venture capital network-based investing model. Again, they're not connected to anyone. <laughs> they, they don't have a pitch deck. They're raw, man. They're really raw. They, they, it's very unlikely that they're a Harvard, Stanford, MBA. And so we've essentially had to build our firm in a manner by which we can go find those entrepreneurs. And about 90% of the investments that we make, we are the ones initiating contact with the entrepreneur versus the other way around. I know a lot about that, what you described, because it, it described me and lead pages when you found us. I've seen a lot of companies that, that sort of match that template or, or sort of look roughly like that. I imagine a, a lot of these people aren't going to kind of startup events. They might not even care about or be connected to the startup community or any of these events that, that people go to. They're pretty head down without giving up the special sauce. How do you, how do you filter for them at scale, right? If you're looking outside Silicon Valley, that's a whole lot of geography. What filters do you put up to catch these folks? We've been doing this long enough where now we've got a pretty large internal database of B2B software companies outside of San Francisco. We know what an Arthur Ventures deal is like with our eyes shut. We've got plenty of examples where an entrepreneur picks up our email and they say that they're, uh, let us know when you're in town sometime, but I'm too busy to get on a phone call. And then we go see them in person next week, like without the phone call. We intuitively like know what it looks like. And so all we've done is that we've come up with ways internally to look at data points that are out there about companies and essentially model out which companies are likely to be a stage fit with our firm. And then from there, we just overlay our own thematic opinions on what's interesting. And the reason I give that context is we're not like robo-calling thousands of companies. We're probably emailing something like five to, to seven entrepreneurs a week. And that's really it. So the point is we've got large data sets. We're always out looking for companies kind of on a calendarized basis across and markets, geographies, what have you. And we've just become quite good at distilling down from data we can find about companies you know, stage fit. And then we just look really hard to find if there are other growth indicators about a company. Is there, you know, a press release? Did they maybe go to one actual panel? Like that's how we found you, right? You were literally speaking, you know, on a panel saying all sorts of crazy stuff. And, and, uh, in between there was, I've got a million dollar AR company growing 20% a month and I'm bootstrapped. And it's like, I, I, I remember when we first invested in lead pages, I told myself, I said, if this isn't what early stage investing is all about, I am going to absolutely suck at this job. So I'm glad, I'm glad it worked out. I remember the initial outreach from you. You know, at the time I was, and, and still am, a curmudgeon about responding to, to associates. Up until then, any call I had with an associate was, it felt like they were just filling out a spreadsheet and asking a lot of really private and invasive questions. Like you, would, you just wouldn't go to a party and say, hey, how much are you making? What are your growth prospects? This is just like a weird thing to ask someone and then these associates would do it. You were an associate, I believe, at the time when you made that investment, but you sent me this email that was 
was like crack cocaine for my entrepreneurial mind. It was just spot on. It was absolutely perfect and really spoke to your understanding of, of where I was at. You know, it was clear that you kind of knew what made us tick. I still think to this day, that's one of the things that, that sets you guys apart and is, is just incredibly impressive is, uh, you know, your ability to put, to put yourself in, in the shoes of, of the entrepreneur without being so founder friendly that, you know, you're not representing your own in- interests as well. Let's say you reached out to a founder and they just want to learn more. They really haven't had someone reach out to them with a calibrated email who understands where they're coming from. Do you ever reach out to them actually hoping that they'll take an investment to take money off the table because you're worried about what an influx of new capital will do to their decision making? If someone's existed a while with constraints in the middle of nowhere, they don't have any friends that have raised VC money, they don't have any peers that they can go to, they haven't seen this play out over and over and over again. I think sometimes it can, can shock an entrepreneur who's never even thought about this all of a sudden they have money in the bank and uh, they might change how they do things. Are you ever hoping they just take the money off the table or a portion of it? You know, I would put it a different way. I think the most important thing to understand is why somebody's taking capital. So what I mean by that is we get concerned when we talk to an entrepreneur and they say, I bootstrapped my way to $2 million in revenue and you know everything's been coming kind of organically and inbound and it just feels like now is the time and I'm going to go hire 10 sales reps And these are the milestones I want to hit over the next 18 months before the cash runs out. To us, that's like a super scary reason to take capital. What we love to hear is, here are the two to three specific things I want to do. And I don't think I am able to do them unless I raise a little bit of capital. And I'm still going to run a very capital efficient business. But I might raise 3 million bucks with an intention of spending one and a half. And I expect to be break even around one and a half and then be in a great position to make my next decision. Like that's a great way to, that's a great reason for taking capital. We certainly have some companies, especially a little bit bigger companies that uh, have proven that they can grow profitably and they do take some money off the table. You know, what matters for us is simply the why. If a company is super profitable and they just want to take a bunch of primary capital into the company without good reason, like that's weird. Why would you just want to dilute yourself? That makes sense. It's really important to understand the why. And that's why we would also be nervous if a company that is Burning a lot of cash is like, I want to raise $2 million a secondary. You know what I mean? It's just odd. So it's more about understanding the real driver behind the decision. Okay, so in terms of this chapter of lessons learned investing outside the valley, it sounds like there's some pattern matching You know, for the kind of company you want to invest in that's outside the valley. There's some pattern matching for the entrepreneur. You have clear thinking on how they're thinking about taking in capital and what they want to do with it. It sounds like if you're doing most of the outreach and most of these people are not involved in startup communities, that kind of going down the, the Fred Wilson, Brad Feld, blogging, social media, thought leadership path, like that probably isn't going to do a lot for you. Have you found that to be the case? Yeah, I mean, it's, that's for us specifically. I try not to be black and white on one, what works and does not work when you're an investor. You kind of have to come up with your own thing. But yes, if you're going to be running an outbound model to go find entrepreneurs. I would call it the minimum viable social media strategy, which is, you know, it's helpful to have something. So when they receive your email and they check you out, there's something there. Like it doesn't look like you're kind of a nobody. Hey, I wanted to pause for a second to let you know that this episode of the Flippening Podcast is brought to you by Nexo, which is, by the way, another leader in the crypto space that's located outside the valley. As someone who personally uses Nexo, I want to point out a few things that I especially like about their crypto-backed loans. First thing, when the price of your collateral grows, so does your credit line. Let's say that you borrow against Bitcoin when it's worth $5,000 each per Bitcoin. But over the course of your loan, the price grows to $10,000. This means that the size of your credit line just doubled as well. I personally haven't seen anyone else doing this. So I think this is pretty innovative and and certainly difficult to pull off from an execution point of view. A second thing I really like about Nexo is that you only pay interest on the amount you borrow. I've seen Nexo competitors require you to take out loans and force you essentially to withdraw the full amount and pay interest on the full amount for the entire duration of the loan. But with Nexo, you get a credit line and can borrow only the funds you need and pay them back whenever you want. 
So take out only the funds you need when you need them, pay them back whenever it makes sense for you. Interest is assessed daily. Again, this just isn't something I've seen other providers do. The final aspect of Nexo I'd like to highlight is that they give you the ability to borrow against a basket of crypto assets. For example, if you post Bitcoin, Ethereum, and BNB as collateral to your Nexo account, the Nexo Oracle calculates the real-time market value of those assets and adjusts your credit line accordingly. To my knowledge, other providers in this space only allow you to borrow against one asset per loan. Okay, back to this conversation with Patrick. But at the same time, the model that we subscribe to here is not one by which we think it's great to write a bunch of blog posts and hope that you know, some bootstrapped entrepreneur happens to lift his or her head up and see our blog post and reach out to us. That works for some people, but that's not what we're going to build our careers on. It seems like there are a lot of structures and support in Silicon Valley for getting a company to a liquidity event. There's lots of acquirers in that area. Most of the, the FANG companies are in that in that area. It's perfectly likely that you could meet someone at a networking event or hear someone at a, a conference next door. They could end up acquiring your company. So when you think about this Venn diagram where in one circle you have companies that are successful and can work outside of the valley and then a, another circle that contains uh, companies that can make it all the way to a liquidity event. What's the sweet spot? I imagine that it's, it's quite possible for a company to be successful outside the valley, to be growing organically at a, at a nice clip, but there's still quite a, a ways that you need to go to actually return money to investors. How do you go about predicting you know, whether or not a company has what it takes to make it all the way? Is, is that simply about churn, willingness of the founder, sort of their vision for the future? How do you know that there's at least a possibility that you can get to the, get to the promised land with that company? I kind of view it across three different vectors here. So the first is, is the company operating in an exciting market? That's usually a relatively easy thing to analyze. It doesn't need to be the most bleeding edge, you know, this company is a uh, blockchain this, AI that, machine learning that, I mean, you get the idea, but it, but it also can't be something that's like we're investing in landscaping software. Okay, like it's got to be something that has some strategic sizzle to it. The second piece is just, is it a real business? Does this company have the financial attributes that we think a large business can be built? So when we look at that, we're looking at, you know, how diversified is the revenue base? What are the sizes of the contracts? Contract size being an indicator for how meaningful that is. What is the retention of the business? And if you look at a business and you say, they're growing well, they don't have customer concentration, they've got great customers and they're retaining them, that's pretty exciting. And then the third part is just the CEO. And it's the hardest part for us to evaluate, at least at Arthur Venture specifically, because we are investing in entrepreneurs that are a little bit more raw. The more product focused. And we've been surprised time and time again on how those individuals can, can grow and scale as people over the life cycle of, of our involvement in the company. When I compare that to what might apply in more of the Bay Area, I think that there's probably more lenience on the financial performance of the business. There was probably a little bit more leeway if you've got, you know, a really great thought leader entrepreneur in a super buzzy market. There was probably less of a focus on the actual financial performance of that business for like earlier takeouts of companies. So I think that's something that is a little bit harder for, for entrepreneurs outside of San Francisco to overcome. And when it comes to an actual liquidity event where you can generate a return, do you think that the kinds of businesses that you invest in, are, are you more likely to see acquisitions than IPOs or at least more likely than maybe a, a pool of similar investments from the Valley? It's a great question. Yes, but like we don't concede that we would not have a standalone public company in our portfolio. Of the 15 companies we invest in per fund, right now in each portfolio, we can point to one to two companies that we think have the attributes to make it all the way. I think what is more different about us versus someone who might just invest only in San Francisco is that our model doesn't require that to happen in terms of generating returns to our limited partners. Our, and the main reason for that, Clay, is just loss ratios are different. Our, our loss ratio within our fund is dramatically lower than what you would expect from 
you know, a San Francisco Series A venture fund. And because of that, we need less, you know, miracles to happen in order to generate the returns that we want to generate. More wins, so each win doesn't have to be <laughs> as large for you guys to make this work. That's interesting. Yeah, but we're still having great outcomes. To us, it's what we get really excited about is when we think a real business can be built. So we have exit certainty to like selling to a private equity firm if we have to. But the company is strategically interesting where the large acquirers are also going to be sniffing around the company as well. When you can have those two things happen, really nice outcomes can be had. Let's transition to chapter two, which is advice for entrepreneurs outside the valley. So maybe a good place to start would be with your comment that when you decide to make an investment in the company, it's important that you guys be the lead investor. And in some cases, you're the the only investor. I can speak from some amount of knowledge of kind of knowing that, you know, if you have VCs involved in a company that that are kind of coming from the Silicon Valley playbook and you have, you know, someone like yourself where you've got a different sort of vision for how a, a company is going to make it across the finish line, that can create some conflicts. Is that an accurate assessment of why you guys would rather be the lead investor? I, I wouldn't necessarily pit it as like us against Silicon Valley or anything like that. I think in general, when you have, and, and the reason I say that is that we're, we're about the least anti-Valley firm you would ever meet. We have a ton of respect for the ecosystem. We just think it's such a dynamic ecosystem that if you're going to invest there, unless you're like Union Square or Foundry Group, you should probably live there. So the comment around being the lead investor is more around that managing multiple people's incentives and alignments can be very hard for an entrepreneur. Like you said, one person's really happy making seven times their money on a deal and somebody else wants to make 50. It gets really hard when the entrepreneur and one investor are really happy with making seven times their money and the other person basically systemically because of their fund structure needs to have a much bigger outcome. Okay, like managing those different alignments is very hard. So we found by us being the lead investor, it's just easier to manage. The other reason that we do it is that it's the product that the entrepreneurs that we talk to want. That heads down bootstrapped entrepreneur, they don't really feel like having to convince five people to say yes. They want to convince one person to say yes. So it's really the combination of those two things has led us to just realizing it's way easier if with the lead investor. And that's why oftentimes with the only investor is a lot of these companies are bootstrapped. There aren't other people there. And so we're not going to make them go find somebody else. We're also not going to go bring in somebody else if we have the money and we believe in the opportunity. I really believe that alignment at the board level is, is so important. Boards, in my experience, aren't like they are on television. They, there's not a lot, a lot of sort of outright conflicts or things going to a vote. But there are different interests at the board level. And when there is conflict or just different ideas about what the company should or should not do, I think those show up in all kinds of odd ways when it comes to sort of the, the operational management of the company. And it, it's not the best thing in the world. Let's talk about the messy middle. You found a company that you really like. You're on the board. They've just accepted some, some VC money. So now there's, there's definitely more pressure that there's a commitment that comes with that. It's not just something someone should take lightly. And now they go about kind of continuing to grow their business. Their goal is to become a growth stage company. And there's this phase between often a, a long phase where you're getting from, Oh, shit, this is working. I can't believe that this didn't die to some kind of an outcome. Do you think the, that messy middle, do you think it's? messier with companies outside the valley because there isn't a whole lot of people around who have grown companies from, you know, let's call it three to five million all the way to 50 to 75. There aren't a lot of middle, middle managers or kind of VPs that have seen this happen over and over again. Or, or do you think it's roughly the same challenge? I would say from a talent perspective, I always think about it as like talent is an issue and also visibility is an issue, which I'll get to in a minute. From a talent perspective, I kind of think it's a wash. And I'll tell you why. Yes, there is less supply of people in a lot of these markets than there would be in San Francisco in terms of people that have been there, done that, and have relevant experience at a relevant company phase in a relevant market and have been successful that you can go recruit. There are more of those people just naturally in San Francisco. I think the benefit of doing it outside of San Francisco is that you just have that loyalty. I think that's what counterbalances it. So it's harder to find people. But when you do, you know, they're not going to 
like every happy hour is not a career fair where they're meeting people and they're jumping around every every year. So I think the retention is is easier there. I actually think the hardest part about what you call that messy middle is a lot of the companies that we invest in, they kind of become, I call it like the hometown hero thing. People write about them because they've raised some money. It's an exciting tech company. It's kind of like not easy, but you know that path from one to 10 million in ARR, annual recurring revenue, has uh, less bumps in the road because things are kind of coming naturally to the business. And then it's usually like between 10 and like 30 million is what I like to call the messy middle. And that's when like numbers get big. It gets harder to, to scale the company, both from a people perspective and then just a broader customer perspective. And then it kind of naturally has some more bumps in the road at that phase. And I actually think what's so hard about that is that it's very visible to the, to the communities in which these companies are being built. Whereas in San Francisco, there are startups everywhere and people are kind of used to the up and down. If you've got a company that's $15 million in revenue and they need to unfortunately let go of 15 people out of 120, that's a headline making thing. And, and that's simply not the case in some of these, these larger markets. So I actually think that is uh, one of the hardest parts of that messy middle that you allude to for, for the entrepreneurs that we work with. If you do a, a reduction in force in San Francisco and you're you know, a sub $100 million company and you let go of 20 people, that's nothing. If you do it in a smaller, medium-sized market or really almost anywhere else, that can make, make the news. Just speaking from my own personal experience, the people you find are more loyal outside the Valley. There's not a a bunch of startups recruiting them kind of all at the same time. But I think what is nice, at least of the times I've been to to San Francisco and other kind of tech hubs, is that I I find I can go to one party and I can talk to, you know, it's a good chance that I'll talk to someone who is really experienced in something that, you know, my company might need at some point. So it's, it's much easier to find out what excellence looks like in different roles when you're kind of surrounded by people who have been there, done that. So maybe it's harder to hire them, but you can get a little bit better at pattern matching just because of the variety of exposure to, to people who have done different things in different ways and in different roles. You're, you're totally right. And that's a big part of why, at least why I believe entrepreneurs have chosen to work with, with Arthur Ventures when they actually don't need capital is because of being a part of a portfolio of other entrepreneurs outside of San Francisco that they really relate to. So they can get on the phone with you or, you know, a great entrepreneur like Anthony James at Linux Academy to hear other product focused entrepreneurs that have scaled businesses really successfully. And they like being able to be a part of that and have that sort of community, for lack of a better word, that isn't naturally there for them in their, you know, 10 mile radius. CEOs tend to be interviewed a lot. They're public facing by nature, but it's not always clear what a good VP of product or a good CFO or a VP of engineering looks like. It's not like you can name a famous public VP of engineering (laughs) and uh, be able to pattern match for that. You've worked with a whole lot of companies. Now you're on the board of a lot of companies. What are some of the common mistakes that you've seen these founders make that can really hurt them? in their business if, if they aren't kind of surrounded by this entire ecosystem, they're going at it alone. Maybe they are the hometown hero. Their articles are being published about them in the local rag and they're thinking they're pretty hot stuff. What are some of the common mistakes that kind of derail the growth of the type of company that, that you invest in? Yeah, it's usually not the, the top line growth of the business. It's usually the cash spend to, to generate that growth. And so a lot of times an entrepreneur will be growing a business relatively organically. And by organically, I mean, they're either using ad spend to drive conversions or they're doing content marketing or they're doing webinars or whatever. And they've got like an inside sales team that are converting the leads. So the point is that they're not like an outbound sales team. And off the heels of that growth, they'll raise capital. And then they'll realize relatively quickly that they, in order to meet the expectations or exceed the expectations of investors, that they're going to start doing unnatural things to their business to chase more growth. And they'll take that capital and they'll start doing things that they never would have done if they didn't raise money, which is they hire 10 sales reps right away. Or they you know, go hire a whole C-level executive leadership team. And the next thing you know, that business is growing at a relatively similar rate uh, than it did before it raised money, but it's spent triple. That's why a lot of the entrepreneurs that we work with, we don't talk about cash burn timelines of, you know, we've got 18 months. We really expect that capital to potentially last and be their only round of capital if it needs to be. 
And so we try to avoid them making these unnatural decisions to try to chase something that's not there. Now, that doesn't mean we don't want high growth. It's just being very intentional about the decisions that you're making and trying to grow your business. Why is that? So you're, you're the, the only mon- money in sub- often, you know, for the first round. And then the, the goal is that they won't raise a B round, or at least you've seen a lot of problems happen at that stage. What are the pitfalls of raising a second round? Well, I mean, so let me just clarify the first, the first statement. We have plenty of companies that have raised multiple rounds of capital. We don't care about if they raise more capital. We just want to be in a position where they don't necessarily have to after our money. So all that means is that we want them to be in a position of strength so they can choose the right round and the right partner and they're not forced into doing it. Once a company brings on that second round of capital, and again, I actually view it as our job to help guide the entrepreneur to what is a great investor for their company. The biggest mistake entrepreneurs make is they mismatch what the investor wants with what they can deliver. And so a great example of this is that we've had a company that was growing like 50% a year. And some investor came in and, you know, paid 10 times revenue for that business. And it was, uh, you know, in the $100 million of valuation range. And that investor wanted a billion dollar outcome. And this entrepreneur has a $10 million revenue business going 50% a year. That, that is a great business. It's a great business. Absolutely great business. But it is, it does not match the return profile of the investor that they brought on. And the reason that happened, is that they didn't have the appropriate conversations around alignment and what do you expect and what are you going to look for out of me? And so that's really the only time I see that secondary piece of capital lead to issues. It's usually around that exact situation. I think that's a really astute point. When someone goes to raise a first round, it was optional, right? I mean, at least for the folks that you're looking, looking at. But the second you raise some money, now you have the opportunity to run a deficit. And if you get to a place where that's just how you run your business, that there's a monthly burn, you're on a sort of a crash course with the in- inevitability of having to raise another fund just to stay afloat. And that could force you to take money from someone where you, know, where you don't have alignment with them. I see that happen all the time. This is about optionality, it's not about a B round necessarily being bad. Yeah, no question. What other advice might you have for entrepreneurs outside the Valley? I think the biggest thing for me would just be behind almost every really big funding headline that you read. And I'm not talking about the, uh, you know, so-and-so raised a series A somewhere, but think about companies like Qualtrics or Atlassian or whomever behind those big, big fundraising headlines where someone raises, you know, one big round of capital for a hundred million dollars. Behind that is a phenomenal business, a phenomenal financial business. And so the point is focus on your business first and creating a great company. And any capital that you would ever want in the world will come find you. And don't do it the other way around. And that's the part where you'll see people get caught up and they think, oh, I got to go raise capital to be validated. If you focus on your business, the capital will 100% find you when you do that. Another thing that kind of stuck out among what you were saying is kind of the, the cost of growth above and beyond your organic growth rate, right? So let's say you have a business and it's growing. Yeah, let's say it's growing 50% a year. and that's what you were doing before you raised venture capital. And so you, you raised some VC money. How much do you think an entrepreneur should try and grow beyond their organic growth rate? How do you think about that? Is, is, is that cash there to do a bunch of kind of measured experiments or growth experiments? We've had a lot of conversations about kind of the, the increasing cost of growth above and beyond your, your organic growth rate. Yeah, we always joke here and we don't have, you know, quantitative data within the portfolio to back it up, but we always say, you know, 90% of your cash burn is trying to add 10% to your growth rate and versus just what, what's organically available in the market. We certainly think that it's a worthwhile exercise to figure out if you can grow faster than your organic growth rate in the market. 
And there are a lot of great reasons to do that. We have some companies that have very clear outbound sales metrics where you know you put in a dollar, you know you're going to get X. And those are really, really clear. What we encourage entrepreneurs to do is to uh, try things in moderation before really pushing the chips in. And so we think it's a great idea, to your point, to run tests. That test might be a different marketing conversion technique. It might be an outbound sales rep. And then once it starts to work, just to step into it. Hire one person, hire two people, hire your third. Don't just do these dramatic, dramatic shifts in the business. Because to your point, that's exactly when you're going to spend pretty much all your money to grow, you know, 80% versus 72%. And that's just really unfortunate. As a side note here, I'm curious what your thought kind of holistically on kind of outcomes in this space is. So I know a few VCs that have had just incredible records. But when you look at some of their largest wins, their largest wins are companies that went public and then later lost 50% of the value in the next year or eventually went to zero and, and went bankrupt. But they were large wins. I know in terms of doing your job and returning funds to your LPs, money is money. Do you feel a certain sense of obligation to create lasting companies or sort of work with founders to create lasting companies? Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, I think you, you put it well. I mean, ultimately, what you're measured on as an investor is the, the financial return of, you know, money out, money in. But certainly there's the pride aspect. You know, every investor wants to be able to point to, you know, a standalone company or a product that has a very long lasting value. I just think that's something that everybody prides themselves in. I mean, even when, you know, you sell a company, even if you have a good outcome, it's never as fun when they say, hey, they bought the company and three months later, they shut down the product. You know, it's much more impactful when they can say, yeah, they bought the company and it's a, now it's a business line. I know that's one thing that my partner, Doug, was really proud of is, you know, at this point, you know, I'm probably going to get this wrong now, but up until at least very recently, if it isn't anymore, Fargo, North Dakota was the second largest campus for Microsoft, more than even Mountain View. And there was about, call it 1,500 to 2,000 people that worked there. Let me tell you the pride that that guy has, even though he hasn't, you know, worked in the company for, you know, 20 years, when you're driving by and you see that and you see people, you know, working there in the community, you see the product out there, which is now Microsoft Dynamics. That's certainly a very prideful thing that people try to measure themselves on. No question. What about scaling companies? I definitely see folks in the blockchain space that have gone out and raised, uh, in some cases, over a billion dollars before they've even shipped a product. (laughs) Let's crack open chapter three, which is about fundraising outside the valley. How to go about doing it, or at least how to go about thinking about it. What do you see as good reasons and and bad reasons to raise funding? When does an entrepreneur know that they're ready? Well, I don't know if an entrepreneur ever really knows they're ready, but I think a good good reason to do it, like we were talking about earlier, is that there's just a very clear use for what you want to do with the cash. And it sounds so obvious, but so often entrepreneurs just think, my business is of this scale, I should go raise money now. And they don't actually think about what they would do with the capital. And again, they might not even be burning it. But just think about what additional hires or what additional bets would you, would you make with the business is probably the number one reason why, why you should do it. And why you shouldn't do it is for any external validation or thinking it means anything about your future likely success as an individual or a a business leader. Full stop. What are your thoughts generally on on founder liquidity? When is it when is that a good idea and when is it a bad idea? Yeah, I mean I think there's uh liquidity as a concept and then and then amount. I think that liquidity when you have proven to be profitable is always an okay thing to consider. To me that's like the number one thing I'll look at. If I meet a company and they're four million dollars of revenue and a million dollars of profit, and like these things are out there. We've seen more profitable companies than that growing really quickly. They absolutely exist. That would be an appropriate time where I would understand if that entrepreneur, you know, didn't want to raise a bunch of capital to dilute themselves and were considering taking a little bit of capital off the table. When you're burning money, in my opinion, is a pretty weak time to take liquidity. I just think, you know, myself as an investor, I would be a little bit concerned in doing that. So within our portfolio, liquidity usually presents itself the most when you're around like 10 million in revenue. It is usually at that point where, you know, either your existing investors or a new investor want the CEO to take some liquidity to ensure that he or she has, you know, the right mindset to go along without any major external pressure around selling early in order to get the nest egg. 
So just to, to make sure that they've been meaning to buy a home or if there's some student debt, I mean, any of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. So they don't take the first interesting acquisition offer right. <laughs> that comes across the table, uh, regardless of the valuation or if it's a fair deal. Aside from looking at reaching out to you directly, let's say uh, an entrepreneur is outside the valley. They're thinking of, of running a fundraising process. Is it generally a good idea to, to reach out to, to VCs or how do you advise founders to go about doing this if they are interested? Yeah, I think that there's a couple of things that, that you do. I think one is if you happen to know anyone that has been a successful entrepreneur, even in your local city, even if it's a different business, go get their opinion first. Maybe people that they've worked with, their experiences, that sort of stuff, because that can just kind of shortcut it a little bit and get you some, some trusted advice. I think the second thing is reaching out is absolutely okay. You know, these days it's shocking how much information that you can find about an investor. They've got a social media presence. All their investments are listed on their website. What I would coach an entrepreneur to do, and again, this is before we're involved. This is like if you're trying to raise your first round of funding, is to research investors that have invested in very similar businesses. It's really not that hard to find. If you're a dev tools company, maybe there's someone who's kind of a prolific dev tools investor and you can, and you can craft a very tailored outreach to that person. You know, even though most San Francisco VCs, even like network based invest, there are plenty of deals that get, that can get converted in the outbound, in the upbound manner. If there's not something there that's market relevant, try to find something that's personally relevant. Maybe there's, you know, a VC that went to college in your town. You know what I mean? And like, there's a reason they come back a lot or they have some tie to the area. There's just a lot of different ways that you can, that you can shortcut that. Cause I oftentimes think that entrepreneurs set their sites too low and what they can get with an investor and they just default to hyper local. And I think that's a real mistake to make. If there's someone great that is hyper relevant in your backyard, go for it. That's terrific. But in absence of that, you know, I would set, I would set the bar quite high. So let's say they're a little bit down that process. They get a term sheet. What do you think is important in a, in a term sheet or to look for in a deal in terms of uh, simplicity or even specific terms? What does a good offer look like? Yeah, sure. So I, I always kind of laugh that everyone gets so focused on the valuation that they overlook all the other stuff that actually matters. So, I mean, usually if I'm like looking at, a, and, and most term sheets now are, are relatively clean if you're raising from a, a reputable firm. But the first thing you're going to look at is, you know, the liquidation preference on the capital. So most venture deals are, you know, a 1x convertible preferred, which means if a firm gives an entrepreneur 3 million bucks for 20% of the company, exit that firm needs to choose between either $3 million or 20%. So if the company sells for 100 million, they're obviously going to take their 20% because 20 is more than three. If the company sells for 1 million, they're obviously, you know, going to take the full one in that case versus taking, you know, 20% of one. So that's the trade-off that they would have to make. Some more like private equity-ish terms that you might see is what's called the participation feature, which means that firm does not have to make the choice at exit between 3 million and 20%. They get 3 million and then another 20%. So obviously the convertible preferred, which is more common, especially within more venture deals, is the cleaner option there. The next thing is you're going to want to make sure it doesn't have any you know, funny stuff like dividends or, or warrants. Those are pretty rare at the early stage. You're also going to want to look at anti-dilution, which means, you know, how is that stock treated in the event that you raise, you know, future capital of a price lower than this? You know, the term you want there is weighted average, which means it matters how much stock you sell at a lower valuation versus what's called full ratchet, which is it doesn't matter if you sell a dollar of stock at a lower price, all my all my stock converts there. And then the last thing, and then I'll just take a breath for a minute and can answer answer questions from you, Clay, is just protective provisions. So this is uh, where the firm puts stuff on the term sheet that they need to approve. So this will say, you know, I need to approve you selling the company. I need to approve you raising more capital. I need to approve you raising debt above 250K. I need to approve you increasing the option pool. You, you get the idea. That is essentially where even if you're selling minority equity, you know, where someone doesn't have control through those provisions, they have control over certain aspects of your business. One thing. I really appreciate about the term sheet I got from you is that it all fit on one piece of paper. That was super cool. I don't know if I had ever seen that before. Yeah, I know we tried to do that. I mean, the reason we did that is if you look at a lot of firms' term sheets, it's like the anti-dilution language takes two pages. And we're just like, this is ridiculous. We can just say what it is. So we, we, we try to deliver one-page term sheets when we can. I think you know, something that, that worked for us and that I would encourage other blockchain entrepreneurs to consider is you know, when they are going to raise 
funding, there are a handful, although there, there aren't a lot um, of, of VCs making investments in this space. And I think it's worth considering you know, what your business fundamentally is. And, and for us, our business was a, a traditional business. And so I opted and I was lucky enough that uh, Patrick wanted to work with me to have Patrick on the board. There's no other sort of traditional VCs involved. And uh, everyone else is a strategic uh, in- investor or, or someone that, that doesn't sort of play the, the traditional VC role. Coinbase Ventures is involved, Digital Currency Group is involved, and a bunch of other kind of token soft, uh, a bunch of amazing people. But at the board level, where alignment is absolutely important, there's only one investor. I think it behooves people in the space to, to really look beyond the names that you typically see in this space, because there's a lot of really experienced investors and they're looking at fundamentals at the end of the day. And Clay, I think just one thing that I think you absolutely nailed it, you know, we don't really companies, especially even within the space should look at, you know, are they a pure play blockchain company that only appeals to, you know, crypto funds or what have you, or like the way we looked at Nomics when we invested was we just thought it was a derivative play off the market. So we just thought it was this really interesting traditional software as a service, web property component that really was just a part of a really exciting market. And it was really no different than any other company that we would invest in. And I imagine that there are a lot of companies in this specific space that are similar to that. And so they probably do have a much broader universe of people that they can talk to. So I just think that's a really, really good point by you. I think people in the space don't realize that the universe of potential partners or uh, VCs they could work with is, is as large as it is. What about, let's say, just kind of post-fundraise? Let's say you're, you're an entrepreneur, you've never had a, a board before, and now you have a board. What do you think is important at the board level You know, for running board meetings? How should you think about them? What's important? What isn't? You know, what, in, in terms of, I guess, any number of things, but in, including you know, board size? <laughs> yeah, we usually try to keep it pretty small in the beginning. I think you know, not dissimilar, dissimilar from when you're talking about the liquidity expectations. I think the number one thing is to have immediate conversation with your investor about what are their expect, expectations from communication? What do they want to be talking about? And if you can actually set that stuff up initially, you avoid situations where one person wants to communicate more than the other one. One person wants a certain level of data that the entrepreneur isn't creating. You get the idea. Assuming that there's alignment there, the most effective board meetings are simply ones where you get the, uh, I like to call it the boring stuff out to people ahead of time just so they can read it. And that's stuff like the financials, the KPIs, what have you. And you can actually take your board meeting and turn it into, you know, call it a 90 minute ish meeting, 60 to 90 minutes where you're really talking about the strategic stuff in the business in areas where you actually want their opinion. And you avoid it being just like a weather report, which is you're reading stuff off a page or you have a board member that's asking you about, you know, what happened to your cost of goods sold line in the month of July. Do you know what I mean? Something that's like incredibly ridiculous and not a great use of time. That's usually what, what I like to see. Keep it small, align on communication, and just make sure that you keep things tight and strategically valuable to what you want to get out of it as an entrepreneur. One thing that, that we're doing and I'm really happy we did it, is you have direct access to our, our Google Analytics, to our accounting software, to our weekly internal all-hands dashboard, to our uh, company Telegram community. I've definitely seen entrepreneurs, and, and I've been in a place myself where I was feeling uneasy about some things in the business. I'm not lying about it or directly masking it, but trying to maintain a narrative that may or may not be sort of the, the most accurate description of what's going on. It was important to me when we work together that we have full transparency across the board and that, you know, you just knew everything that's happening. And we actually share that at the company level now, like everyone who's, who's involved, you know, sees, uh, unless there's a super sensitive part of the board deck, but, see, you know, sees the board deck sees all the company metrics and financials and numbers. They know how much runway we have, you know, how much revenue we have, et cetera. And, and uh, I think transparency is one of those things that uh, if you don't have it from the very beginning, it's, it's really hard to retroactively, you know, do that a couple of years after the company's around. There's just too many surprises that you haven't uh, dealt with along the way necessarily. So uh, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of that. Let's transition to chapter four, which is about the investment opportunities in the blockchain space. 
What do you think about the investment opportunities you're seeing in the space? What advice might you have for, for an entrepreneur that's operating in this space or, or a VC who's making investments in this space? Yeah, well, I think it's actually a pretty exciting time right now. You know, right when we invested in Namix, I felt like it was a death period for your broader market. Hey, this is Clay cutting in from the editor's booth to give some more context on what Patrick is saying. Nomics was established at the end of 2017 when Bitcoin was at an all-time high of around $20,000. We launched the Nomics API and unveiled Nomics.com, our crypto market data site, in the spring of 2018. In December of that same year, when Bitcoin's price was hovering around $4,000, we announced our Series A investment round led by Arthur Ventures, also involved in the round were digital currency group, Tokensoft, Coinbase Ventures, Ben Davenport, Polymath, and King Capital. When we raised, things were really looking kind of bleak for the space, and we had come down quite a bit from the all-time high. So there you go. All right, back to the show. It certainly wasn't you know, the all-time high of people being bullish on it. And I think through that process, I, th- I, I believe a lot of waste is too strong of a word, but I feel like a lot of uh, maybe not so serious projects or businesses or investors probably left, left the ecosystem. And so right now, I just think it's a really encouraging time where a lot of the people that have been building have been building for the right reasons. That's what I'm really excited about right now. And my biggest piece of advice would, would just be, in addition to just the, the really attractiveness of the, of the market and the great long-term potential within this space, continue to focus on building a real business. Just continue to think about how you can actually create a stable, long-lasting enterprise within this market. And if you're patient, you're probably going to come out great on the other end. Well, that concludes my conversation with Patrick Meenan from Arthur Ventures. I hope you enjoyed it. Before you go, I want to mention that since we've started producing episodes at a much higher rate, we now have room for a few more sponsors. If you like the work we do and would like to support the show, then a sponsorship might be a good fit for you. I can say from our own experience that flipping sponsorships work. In fact, we would do these shows even if nobody else sponsored because of the business it brings to us. And over 80% of paying customers mentioned that they heard of us through our podcast. If you're interested in sponsoring the show, please hit us up via email at support at nomics.com. Okay, that wraps up things for this week. Stay tuned for next week's episode. Until then, take care. Goodbye. That's it for this week. To sign up for our free crypto investing newsletter, listen to other episodes, or get the show notes from this episode, please visit flippening.com. I also invite you to check out the startup that funds this podcast, Nomics, spelled N-O-M-I-C-S, at nomics.com. Finally, if you got value from the show, the biggest thing you can do to help us out is to leave a five-star review with some comments and feedback on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening, and see you next week.